So our last uh, snippet from for this week is going to look at the uh, the run up to the election of uh, of 1984, um, where Reagan ultimately will win a a, a smashing uh, victory. So you, you can sort of see where this was going to be coming, that defense spending is increasing and the United States seems to be confronting the Soviets winning the Cold War in a way that it hadn't been under Carter. Um, the economy is doing uh, better than it had been. But there are also some really controversial elements of the Reagan agenda that uh, make him a, you know, a deeply polarizing president in, in some respects. He's, you know, he's very much admired by conservatives, but, uh, but despised by, uh, by liberals. Uh, and there are there are sort of two areas. The first is his treatment of unions, and then the second is his uh, his stand on some social issues. So, with regards to unions, you know, Reagan's approach was straightforward. He saw um, the you know the, the the union movement in the United States as too powerful. His argument was that it had detracted from. Um, uh, from U.S. economic uh, production. And he gets a chance to prove his new approach to unions very early on. In 1981, shortly after he becomes president, um, this organization called the, the, um, uh, the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization, PATCO, goes out on strike. Um, they want more wages, they want better uh, working hours, you know, all, all sorts of things. The, the problem here is that they are federal employees who as part of their uh, their position under the law were forbidden from striking. And their assumption was that because air traffic controllers are, are so vital to the economy, if you don't have air traffic controllers, there's going to be no flying. They assumed that they would strike, they would get benefits, uh, and, uh, and that this approach would, would prove correct. Reagan, however, saw this as a way of striking at the power of, uh, of unions as a whole. He gave them a warning that if they didn't uh, go back to work, he would fire every air traffic controller in the country. Um, and this is what he does. Those who remain out on strike are fired. They are not rehired. In fact, many of them are never rehired. Reagan shifts military air traffic controllers to the civilian uh, uh, towers to keep the planes more or less uh, uh, running. And the move is seen correctly as a reversal of, uh, of federal policies, really since the, the, the Roosevelt administration, of more friendly towards unions in union uh, uh, management uh, uh, struggles, where Reagan is more friendly towards, towards the management side of, uh, of things. And Reagan staffers on key uh, economic uh, uh, bodies like the National Labor Relations Board also tend to be more favorable to uh, towards the business side of things rather than towards uh, towards the worker side of things. In retrospect, this was a, a, a tremendous miscalculation by uh, by the labor movement as a whole. And union membership throughout the 1980s declines as the U.S. economy moves away from more industrial. Uh, heavy in, industrial uh, uh, jobs towards uh, more service uh, industries. And this hurts the Democrats, helps the Republicans uh, uh, politically. The second are on social issues. Re Reagan himself, you know, he's a, he's a former actor, he's divorced. Um, you, you know, it's, it's, it's not clear that Reagan himself cared very much about social issues, but he recognized that a critical element of his political base did, and he accommodated this newly empowered religious uh, uh, evangelical uh, base. His attorney general was Ed Meese, a longtime friend from California, who was very close to, uh, uh, to sort of social uh, conservatives. Um, and Meese uh, uh, was quite aggressive in sort of using the Justice Department uh, on conservative issues, but particularly in doing more rigorous screening of federal judicial nominees. This is the sort of thing now which is routinely done by presidents of both parties. Um, but the, goal, the Meese goal was to appoint more conservative judges who, especially on the issue of abortion, which was a kind of baseline issue for um, uh, uh, for social conservatives, uh, might work to chip away at Roe versus Wade. The, the problem for conservatives was this uh, was this chart, um, which is that public opinion on abortion largely has remained constant ever since Roe, um, and that is that a majority of Americans, or you know, slightly ab uh, above or below half. Um, believe that abortion should be legal, but only under some circumstances. That is, they're okay with restrictions on late-term abortions, or they're okay with restrictions on other types of abortions, but they don't think that abortion should be illegal as a whole. Uh, anywhere between a quarter and a third of Americans believe that abortion uh, should be uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, legal. 
um, and the remainder believe that it should be illegal. The problem is that the Reagan position was, uh, was associated with this illegal side that never had anything close to majority popular, uh, popular support. Um, and so the, the progress of the pro-life movement in the 1980s is, is incremental at best. Abortion remains legal throughout the period. There are relatively few restrictions, although the federal government does not pay um, for abortions uh, through federal health care uh, uh, policies. There is a more aggressive move on gay rights. Um, these are photographs of Reagan with Jerry Falwell, who was the most important evangelical supporter for uh, Reagan. Um, and the religious right uh, uh, moves heavily towards, uh, towards the Reagan policies uh, throughout the 1980s. And in exchange, they want uh, a more aggressive uh, condemnation of homosexuality that comes from the Reagan administration, which largely they, uh, they get. Um, this unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, uh, coincides with the AIDS crisis. Um, the first mention of AIDS from uh, the white, Reagan himself does not mention AIDS in, in 81 or 82. The first mention of AIDS from the White House uh, podium comes in this press conference uh, between a reporter and Larry Speaks, who was the acting White House press secretary uh, um, after his, his, uh, his uh, predecessor, Jim Brady, had been shot in the, in the Reagan assassination. And you can read the, the lines for, for yourself. I mean, this is, it's just a repulsive um, uh, commentary. And it fits the, the, the general attitude of the Reagan administration towards gay rights issues as a whole and towards AIDS in particular. I mean, we're now living through this pandemic where you know, the, the, the federal government is, is at least trying to do something, how effective it's being is, is unclear. Um, during the 1980s, though, the, the, the federal government largely ignored AIDS. The argument was, well, it's only targeting people who are gay or it's targeting people who are using intravenous drugs. They're, they're sort of getting what they deserve. Um, and so there's this, uh, this, this, this really troubling um, uh, degree of indifference uh, towards the plights of, uh, of people who have AIDS. And you know, it's almost certain uh, that, a, um, that a treatment for AIDS would have been developed far more quickly if the Reagan administration had focused more aggressively on finding a, a solution for the disease, but it didn't fit in with the, uh, with the political agenda. And this, unlike abortion, um, the Reagan approach largely reflects public opinion. You can see a big spike up here in the, uh, the late 80s. Um, among Americans who believe that gay or lesbian relations between consenting adults should be illegal. That is, that there should be a criminal prosecution um, uh, for gay or lesbian couples. And the spike up in the, um, uh, in the, uh, the mid 80s to nearly three in five Americans is an outgrowth of the AIDS crisis and this fear of, uh, of, of AIDS sweeping the, uh, the, the country, this, this disease with, no, with at the time, no, uh, no cure. So it's within this environment. We have, we have a popular president, but a president with, who has really aroused a lot of liberal opposition um, that we get the 1984 election, um, where the Democratic front runner, because Ted Kennedy chooses not to run, is Carter's former vice president, Walter Mondale. And you can kind of ask yourself what possibly would have motivated the Democrats to have nominated the, the vice president of a president who had lost 44 or 50 states, but nonetheless, Mondale is popular with unions and he's popular with civil rights activists, sort of the, 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 the core constituencies of the Democratic uh, uh, Party. But he's challenged in, in something of a surprise by a Colorado senator named Gary Hart, who runs a generational campaign. He says that he's promoting new ideas. He never quite explains what these new ideas are, but it sounds, uh, it sounds nice. He's a better speaker than Mondale. He's perceived correctly, I think, as more electable than, uh, uh, than Mondale. Um, he defeats Mondale in the New Hampshire primary, and this winds up being an incredibly close uh, uh, primary contest. Hart carries the states that are in red on this map, Mondale carries the states that are in blue on this, uh, this map. And the breakdown here, although it's not a precise breakdown, um, depends largely on the African-American share of the population. African-American voters remain loyal uh, to Mondale. It's very similar to what we've seen from Biden uh, in, the, in the 2020 campaign. The sense is that Mondale is someone who has been there for black voters in the past. Hart you know, doesn't have much of a record on civil rights issues. He had not imposed civil rights measures at the end, but a major player on them. Um, Hart does very well with moderate voters, with suburban voters, with independent voters. He would have been a much stronger candidate for the Democrats uh, if he'd been nominated, uh, but um, he, uh, he loses and Mondale gets the nomination. 
Mondale is, is, is trailing in the polls at the time he, he gets the nomination. He thinks he needs to spice things up. And so he announces that he's going to nominate a, uh, decides to nominate a woman as his running mate. Geraldine Ferraro, who's a congresswoman from Astoria, becomes the first female uh, presidential or vice presidential nominee of a major uh, party. For, Ferrara was a was a re really quite talented legislator, um, but the problem is she had only served three terms in the House. She had never even won state statewide in New York. There was a sense that she was being chosen in large part because she was a woman rather than because she was the more qualified uh, candidate. And so, while her 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 nomination sparked a degree of excitement initially, it it, it did relatively little to help the campaign in the uh, in the end. And you can see from this uh, chart, this is the polling chart between Reagan and Mondale. Mondale started to fall behind in April and May as the economy started to, uh, to, to get better. Uh, and by the time we got to October and November, he was trailing Reagan by around 20 points in the polls and his chances of victory seemed incredibly uh, remote. And it turns out incredibly remote uh, understates it. Um, Mondale lost every state in the country except for his home state of Minnesota and the District of Columbia. And Reagan, in an element of kind of sort of good grace, um, chose not to aggressively campaign in Minnesota. If he had done so, Reagan probably would have carried Minnesota as, uh, as well. And the choice here was not a difficult choice. Reagan's argument was that the economy was, was recovering. And so the choice was between the better economy that the country had seen under Reagan's first term or the terrible economy that uh, the country had seen under the Carter Mondale administration. And Mondale never really had a rebuttal to that, uh, to that approach. That said, unlike in 1980, um, there was no significant uh, uh, swing towards the, uh, towards the Republicans at congressional races. This really wasn't much of a mandate for Reagan's policies. In fact, the Democrats gained seats in the, uh, in the Senate. They picked up the uh, Tennessee seat that went to Al Gore uh, Jr. They won in Illinois, um, and they also won in Iowa. They defeated the incumbent Senator Roger Jepson. You look at Jepson, he, he sort of looks like a senator. He had a nice hair and deep voice. Um, campaigned and, and won a big upset uh, thanks to Nick Pack, remember that political action committee I've been talking about, about a little earlier, um, and, and had compiled this, this really quite uninspiring record in the, uh, in the Senate. He was regarded as an intellectual uh, uh, lightweight. He had run, though, as a family values Republican. He said it was very important to honor God and family, that he thought, you know, thought a lot about the, the, the marital bonds and the, the, um, the, the great relationship he had with his wife. And so he, he, his campaign ran, ran into problems when it was revealed um, uh, in, in the summer that, that he had, had joined a, a, mas a massage parlor um, that... Uh, but had engaged in prostitution. And his, his excuse was that he, he didn't re realize that there was prostitution going on. Um, and he, you know, he issues this apology, but uh, he, he's exposed really as a hypocrite. Um, and he loses overwhelmingly in Iowa to a senator named Tom Harkin, who we'll encounter again in this class as quite liberal uh, Democrat, who is the chief sponsor of a, of a very important civil rights law called the Americans with Disabilities uh, uh, Act during the Bush administration. The one Republican gain came in Kentucky. It was the biggest upset of the, uh, the 1984 election. The front runner throughout the race was D. Huddleston, a moderate uh, uh, Democrat, led in every poll, um, but was narrowly defeated by fewer than 6,000 votes by Mitch McConnell, um, who was the county executive in, uh, in, uh, uh, the, in Louisville, uh, won the area, which is now a very strongly Democratic area, and used that to, uh, to prevail. So one of the legacies of the 1984 elections is that it brings Mitch McConnell to the, uh, to the Senate. So the majority leader that we now have would not be here. Um, Huddleston loses in large part because he was overconfident. Uh, he, he was leading in the polls. He didn't do a lot of campaigning. McConnell uh, uh, he was absent a lot from the, uh, uh, the Senate. He had a tendency uh, to accept honoraria for speeches. This was legal at the time. So if you were a senator um, and some business group or you know, labor group calls you up and say, you know, we really want to hear you and we'll give you $10,000 to speak before us, you know, kind of a bribe, but, uh, but it was acceptable at the, at the time. 
Um, and McConnell does this very uh, amusing ad, which I've sent the, uh, the link for, um, that has these uh, uh, dogs who are trying to find where Huddleston is when he's not in the, uh, in the Senate. So that's what we have for, um, for, for this batch of snippets. Uh, hope everyone's gotten a little bit from, from this information and uh, staying safe. And I will see everyone at our um, uh, next, uh, our, our video conferences sometime later in the, uh, uh, in the week.